Welcome to the last substantive session of day two of the Parapsychology Foundation International Affiliates Conference. We've got Dr. Mario Varvoglis, who will be giving this presentation and thankfully introducing himself because I can't uh, get that PowerPoint up here at the moment because of technical reasons. So I'm going to shut off my microphone so that I'm not making noise in the background. And Mario, just tell me next whenever you need me to move the slide. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks to the uh, PF, the Barrister Ecology Foundation, for including me in this uh, very interesting series. I've been in the field for too long to admit, betrays my age, but between us, I began in the mid-1970s as a volunteer at the Maimonides Dream Laboratory at the, where Chuck Onerton was in the first few publications around the Gonsfeld. So I, my first, my introduction to parapsychology was via the Gonsfeld. And I survived the Maimonides and was invited to join psychophysical research labs in Princeton. And at that time, uh, I was kind of in the midst of my doctoral research and turned into a my doctoral uh, my in, in experimental psychology was was dedicated to Michael Piquet. He did a pretty complicated uh, uh, doctoral thesis. And uh, then I continued to work at PRL until the mid-1980s when I was kind of talked into, <laughs> convinced via a romance that I had with a, a research assistant who arrived at PRL, Christine Hardy, to join her in France. And uh, I thought that was a great opportunity to start anew in France with a, like our own thing, our own laboratory. And I was uh, in for a bit of a surprise when I came here. Things were not at all as they had been, we had thought they might be. And, France was not the place to start a new laboratory uh, uh, that easily. So at any rate, uh, after uh, about 10 years in France, I ended up becoming president of the Institut of Sushik, which is what I'm going to be presenting today. But in the meantime, I did keep some contact with the field, of course, in various ways as a uh, doing some research with the help of a, a Swiss research foundation, the Odier Foundation, and also with them create, starting to get more and more into educational aspects of parapsychology, uh, namely by the development of a CD-ROM called Sci Explorer, and also through some general public books and progressively through TV and other supports. And that's where it's at right now. I've been at president of the Institute since 1998. And um, I've gone through, uh, like many of us, I've gone through the board of the Parapsychological Association. I've been a president for one year. And uh, I think I'm ready to go now. So I'm, I'm liking, I would like to give a, a kind of my respects to all kinds of people who have participated seriously in parapsychology in the last 50 years. And one of the those who have been quite active is named Yves Lignon. He's, uh, he was uh, a lecturer in statistics at the University of Toulouse. He puts himself in the Rhinian tradition. He was a big defender of Rhine and Rhine's approaches. But he's mostly known for his field investigations of poltergeists and of um, different large-scale claims. And he's been a very prolific writer and put out quite a few books, at least a dozen of them, in the past 25 or 30 years. And the last one of his books is actually seems to be leaning towards a survivalist hypothesis by focusing on NDEs and, and the reincarnation uh, research of Stevenson and others. 
Unfortunately, Yves Lignon was a, a rather controversial figure in France, partly because of his clash with the, the, the French rationalists, which have been pretty harsh. He's very outspoken, and so were his, the, uh, his rationalist op opponents. And also because of some of his, the way he promoted himself, let's say, let's say in terms of his status in the university, which the university wasn't quite uh, aligned with. At any rate, he's, he was and is a figure, a major figure, quite well known in the field, especially for the great, the general public. And he tried to keep parapsychology alive in different ways. One was through his, uh, organization for research in parapsychology and the paranormal, and also through his Revue Française de Parapsychologie. So we're, I'm still in touch with him on and off, and so are many others. And he's definitely a, a, a good person in the field, even if, if there's, he's just, like I said, a subject of much controversy and difficulties, uh, both within the field and with skeptics. Okay, next. So I'm starting from the south of France. We can go to the next slide. I'd like to also mention somebody else that's in Toulouse named Bernard Oriol, who's a psychiatrist. And he's been interested in Psy for a long time, and he's been specifically interested in altered states of consciousness. One of the distinguishing figures of Bernard Oriol, who was also a member of the Institut Metapsychique for quite a while. One of the distinguishing figures is that he undertook a, a big, large-scale experiment on group telepathy, basically looking to see whether a kind of majority vote procedure would enhance psi scoring, involving, let's say, many individuals of a group uh, independently uh, making a choice on specific targets and seeing whether that kind, by extracting a majority vote score, whether in fact the results went up. Unfortunately, after a huge amount of work, as you see here on the slide, it didn't pan out. Uh, nevertheless, it was a, a very, you know, it was, a, I would say, a pretty advanced and uh, interesting undertaking, and it was supported by the ODA Foundation, which we will be coming to in a few minutes. Next slide. Now I'm mentioning, <laughs> I forgot to put his name here. I'm mentioning Simon Thorpe, who is a, a researcher. He's a definitely a mainstream researcher in cognitive science, specifically interested in vision. And uh, I'm mentioning him because all of a sudden we discovered he was interested in parapsychology a few years ago. And he also is in Toulouse, uh, at another university in Toulouse. And he was the uh, the invited speaker for the Viterbo Convention in 2013 in Italy. And he gave a nice talk on consciousness and expressed very clear interest in getting involved in parapsychology. Um, that was that was almost two years ago, two good years ago. We had good interactions. So far, I haven't seen whether that has advanced at all, uh, but I think it, it's worth mentioning this, this because it's he's definitely in a very conspicuous and visible and orthodox cognitive psychology center with quite a few researchers under him, so it would be a, a great thing if he does get involved. So this is like a my wish list for tonight. He is, there's also Arnaud Delorme, who is wo working closely with Dean Radin in uh, Anoetics, and he's French, and he comes by once in a while from, by fr in France, and we get to see him uh, once in a while. And I'm also hoping that we'll be able to collaborate with uh, Arnaud at some point. Okay, next slide. So now we're coming to some serious stuff. As you see from François Favre is, uh, and Pierre Janin, two key players in uh, one of the attempts to organize parapsychology 
in France was called the GERP, Groupe d'études et de recherche en parapsychologie, in the 70s and 80s. A serious attempt, they, they tried to actually establish courses within the university. They didn't actually establish a real unit credit, but at least they did get to do quite a few uh, to introduce parapsychology in the university in France and did a large number of conferences in France and elsewhere. Now, they, there was definitely a, a signature to GERP, uh, especially given by François Favre, who is on the left, and uh, depending on how you look at him, he, he looks either very friendly or very mean, and depending on his humors, he can be one or the other. Uh, so the, the orientation here is very interesting, I think, because he clearly uh, breaks with the physicalistic, let's say, trends in parapsychology, or even the objectivist trends, and sets the field, uh, psychic phenomena, in, in a clear-cut intentionalist, uh, subjectivist, uh, socio-sociological and historical dimension. Uh, he says that whatever we see on the objective end is incomplete if we don't understand the history, the context, the meaning of an event, which for that reason he considers that the laboratory, reproducing laboratory events is kind of, it's past its time, it's a, it's a meaningless endeavor uh, because we will never be able to get full reprodu replicability uh, as the part of the equation, which is the meaning equation, is going to be forever missing in the lab, especially if we try to reproduce uh, an effect many, many times, because it loses its meaning progressively. We could get back to this if you wish to at some point, but other members of the GERP, not all were completely in accord, in agreement with François Favre, who's kind of a, a dominant figure, but there was a strong orientation in general to this subjectivist aspect, and Pierre Janin, who was right next to him, nice and young there. He was one of the people that got me real excited about the field when I came to France in the mid-70s. Um, as I write in my biography, Chuck Onerton smuggled me into a parapsychology foundation uh, convention that was taking place in Paris. And uh, that didn't please Alan Angle all too much, but Chuck held his ground and so did I. And I met uh, Janin, uh, I think, at that point. I mean, my memories are unclear, but I certainly heard about his the early um, ideas around the psychoscope, which we'll be talking about, and a kind of almost animistic view of the relationship between an individual and uh, a device in PK experiments. I think this is a it's it's very interesting. I don't know how know what to make of it, but it's a very interesting view that in some sense in PK, the object that we're trying to influence is entering in some kind of relationship with us, as opposed to thinking of it as a force that we're exerting. Uh, this is again in the subjectivist as opposed to objectivist kind of vision of what psi phenomena are really about. Next slide. Now we have to come to something that's very different from the GERP. That was very different from the profound, highly, you know, very uh, epistemological reflections. This is pure, let's say, demonstration. It's pure uh, theater. Not theater in the sense that it's fake, but theater in the sense that it's very much oriented towards the show, the spectacle of parapsychology. As you remember, Yuri Geller was a big uh, left traces everywhere. And in France, we had the French Geller whose name is Jean-Pierre Girard. So Jean-Pierre Girard is an interesting, very interesting case because, uh, uh, again, it's we're in this fuzzy domain where we're, we're never quite sure what's going on, but there have been, he, he's definitely a performer, he's definitely a magician, and he definitely uh, has been caught to cheat on some occasions. And on the other hand, he has also been studied, observed, 
under well-controlled conditions, namely at some point Richard Matuck and some others uh, observed him up close in some uh, experiments. And also the main uh, research with him was at the Pichiné Metal Metallurgical Laboratory where some very good level uh, researchers studied Girard's, Jean-Pierre Girard's ability to affect metal enclosed in glass tubes and also uh, under, under pretty good conditions with, with analyses, metal, metallurgical analyses that suggested that in any case the effects that they found could not have been accomplished via any kind of force or heat or known electromagnetic influence, certainly not under the conditions that they were conducting the experiments. Uh, nevertheless, the, the skeptics here have a pretty strong case against Girard because he himself is, has this tendency of, of uh, fussing or fuzzing around with the data sometimes and he's a self-proclaimed parapsychologist and he's giving courses and things. So that, that kind of discredits some of his uh, stuff. And what it, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's one of those cases where there certainly was quite a bit of potential there, I think, for it being a breakthrough and it hasn't quite lived up to that. Okay, next slide. I think uh, it's just another slide with Jean-Pierre Girard, but we can move on. Yeah, this is uh, one of the studies um, where one of the trials where it's shown also where he's applying pressure, but with a strain gauge attached. And so any possibility of him actually conducting cheating or anything is very closely monitored. Okay, next slide. So is this just, there, there's been, in fact, in France, a strong interest in psychokinesis. That has been one of the main things, and, and Jean-Pierre Girard is kind of like, a, let's say, a manifestation of that strong interest, as well as this next uh, part we're going to look at, which is the typoscope, or ticoscope, which was created by Pierre Janin, who we saw earlier. And what's very interesting about this, we could move to the next slide as well, is that Janin was created a system which he hoped would show that indeed the PK uh, agent comes into a kind of a relationship with this little robot, the ticoscope, that moves around. And it could, you could almost imagine it as being kind of a living system, like a cat or a dog or a little robot that obeys you when, it, when you're nice to it. And this kind of psychological set seemed to be very promising for the ticoscope and a major, major figure in, in French politics and economy, Ambroise Roux, adopted it as a, a testing system, and he conducted some pretty long-term uh, tests within the Compagnie Générale de l'Electricité, which uh, I, I don't know what the equivalent would be like, maybe General Electric in the United States. This is very big. It's a, set, a key, a key state-owned company. Uh, at the time, and Ambroise Roux had Pierre Janin uh, construct a, a considerable number of, uh, of ticoscopes. I don't remember how many, maybe 20. And he used these to test all kinds of individuals in, the, in his company. He actually took space to do these tests within the company. And so as you see, he had uh, over 200 people tested over three years. And Unfortunately, uh, we have only a very short report, which came out in a book that was co-authored with Stan Krippner and I believe Jerry Sultan. I hope I'm right on that. And in this short chapter, there was a description of the Titoscope work where he, Ambroise Roux says that 40% of the sessions provided unde evidence for undeniable anomalies. That is an absolutely astronomical percentage. And 18% and only almost, you know, 20, you know, almost one fifth of those tested produced very significant results. 
So this is something that actually I, I'd like to see if Stan Krippner, I, I'm going through this again, I, I want to see if Stan has any more data on this that maybe Ambroise Roux provided, because it, it's just historically astonishing. To take to answer the question by Bob, yes, we have, there are uh, ticoscopes right now. We have one at the INI that was constructed internally, and there were two constructed upcoming right in the next slide by the ODA Foundation, and uh, René Opeoc uh, has those, but I'll talk about them in a second. This is just to say that we're talking about a, a, a very interesting tool that was created by Pierre Janin originally, taken on by Ambroise Roux, and in a moment we'll see, was also adopted by uh, more recently, in more recent research, and we're also having one copy at the Institute. Now I'm showing you this slide because Marcel Odier, this is the Odier Foundation that, they're not French, uh, Marcel Odier is Swiss in Geneva, his, his wife is French, and they launched a foundation, a research foundation that really helped the field for a good decade or more. They got me started in France. They, they su supported my research with random number generators at first, and then as shown in the next slide, but we'll get to that in a minute, they helped me produce a, a C an educational CD-ROM called Sci Explorer. But before we get to that, I just want to mention two individuals that were uh, key theoreticians and experimenters in France. The one is the biologist Rémi Chauvin, who is, uh, I'm sure you have heard of. He's, uh, he was a key, key uh, academic figure at the La Sorbonne in uh, biology, and he conducted uh, some animal sci experiments, and he was a very, very smart and, and interesting and clever uh, uh, scientist. He was uh, against the Rhinian paradigm because he thought it was not natural enough. Uh, he had a more of an ethological, meaning a, a field orientation. Um, and he was, so he conducted some animal sci experiments and he wrote a lot of books some views sometimes that could be considered rather radical in at least in Anglo-Saxon parapsychology. Uh, he was definitely more had Catholic background and uh, uh, certainly a practicing uh, Catholic uh, uh, person, uh, as was also the physicist Olivier Costa de Beauregard, who is also, I would say, a, a giant, an underappreciated giant in, in France underappreciated perhaps because he he came out of the closet and spoke in favor of parapsychology, possibly because he had some personal experiences, but also because in his work, in his collaboration with Louis de Broglie, who is a famous uh, QM uh, physicist, quantum mechanics physicist, he eventually came to think of the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, you know, the uh, the the uh, intricated or uh, entanglement uh, experiments, he had a rather clear-cut position from early on, even before the definitive EPR experiments were done in France, that stated that this is not a correlation in space, but correlation in time. Uh, they're kind of inspired, he was inspired by Feynman's temporal zigzags. And in that sense, he thought, he believed that Precognition and PK can both be explained in terms of negative entropy or uh, a form of uh, retrocausation. It's a point of view that has been coming back again and again in the field in different uh, parts of the world, especially in the observational theorists, in different forms. And I think uh, Olivier Costa Borga was really ahead of his time when he was proposing these in the 70, early 70s. So this is another uh, key figure in, in uh, the French scene, so to speak. And the reason I'm associating with Marcel Odier is because they were both uh, key figures in the foundation uh, that Marcel Odier created to support parapsychology and new physics, let's say. So we can move on to the next slide just to 
pay tribute also to two other individuals who were uh, part of, who were helped and who, or who were connected with Yodia Fadesh. And one is Christine Hardy, with whom I came to France in 1985. Uh, we separated since then, but she was key in my starting, getting started here. And uh, the foundation, of course, helped the work that we were doing with Christine in the early years I was here, and the creation of this CD-ROM Psy Explorer that I think some of you may know. It's been the, the American version and the French version, and it's uh, uh, got pretty well known in the field and somewhat beyond the field. The other person is Maud Christen here. She was also responsible for the connection I had with the Odier Foundation. I believe she was one of the people that recommended me to them, so I owe her a debt in that. But besides that, Maud Christen is one of these rare psychics who is honest, psychic, high ethics, very good. She gets very good reviews. She's uh, been kind of the sweetheart of French TV for years, but nevertheless, she has been very outspoken critic of, let's say, mindless pro or anti parapsychology. Uh, in other words, mindless thinking and being too gullible or being too skeptical. So she's She's a pretty incredible lady. Unfortunately, she ended up leaving France and moving somewhere else because I think she couldn't take it anymore in this country with the um, general attitude. But uh, at any rate, that's my own speculation. Next slide. So um, um, I had mentioned, I, I mean, I thought I was going to have control of this PowerPoint and skip in a little bit different way back and forth. But at any rate, we're back with the Ticoscope here. Uh, like I said, there was Pierre Janin, and then there was Ambroise Roux, who adopted it and had some phenomenal results with this little moving robot. And this is René Péoc, who's, a, who's got a, he's a medical doctor, and he has a PhD. And he got interested in animal psi, uh, inspired by Rémi Chauvin, and he pushed the whole this whole paradigm of, of uh, a kind of a, let's say, a more interesting RNG interface, random number generator interface, uh, using this robot kind of thing. He pushed it to its logical limits by using, by, uh, you, uh, by introducing the priming, priming? No. Is that the right word? Priming. I'm, I'm having a block now. I'm confusing it with. Imprinting, the imprinting reflex of chicks, he was able to, he had lots of chicks in his barn, and he imprinted them to this little robot. And following that, the he would put the chicks in a cage, we can go to the next slide, at one end of a, of a big, you know, uh, So as you see on the no that just before that first. So as you see on the right hand side here, there's a there's a square and in that that square represents a cage with um, 15 chicks. I had a video on this, but it was so huge, unfortunately, that I, I wasn't able to upload it. So I just had to redo the PowerPoint without it. And the video is very uh, impressive and very interesting. But at any rate, what you have here is basically the cage is on the right-hand side. The ticoscope is placed in the center uh, of, the, of this rectangle. And then it's allowed to roam freely. And of course, as it has a random number generator as its brain, it's supposed to do a, what's known as a random walk. Nevertheless, the, in the next slide, we can, here you can see one trial whereby the the random walk quickly translates into a kind of a dense concentration near the chicks, which makes sense because the chicks, if they are imprinted to that object, moving object, and since they cannot move to follow it, it would make sense that if there is such a thing as animal decay, 
they would, as they can't follow it, it will follow, it will come towards them. And so uh, in the next slide, you can see that there are the, the, the full exper one of the full experiments that René Peog did with just doing, splitting the surface 50%, the one half of the rectangle of the surface close to the chicks and the other far, you can see the density of uh, results favoring proximity to the chicks. I, I can look for the YouTube. I, I, I don't have the address offhand, but perhaps, uh, yeah, the one that's listed there is the YouTube um, one that I'm referring to. Okay, so again, this is when, when I said metapsychique à la française, it's also to emphasize that so far we're, we're talking mainly about individuals, mostly individuals who make their mark. It's not exactly teamwork. It's a bunch of individuals who either within the, uh, an academic context or independently of academic context, but all quite qualified do research both on the theoretical side and on the experimental side. The exception to that, or the attempted exception, was the GERP, the GERP, which was a kind of a loose association of individuals with their, each with their own point of view, and not much by way of experimental research at any rate, except for Pierre Janin's Ticoscope. Now, I would like to move on and to start speaking about maybe one, the one I think it's the next slide, I'm not even sure. You can see what's coming up next. Yes, that's what's coming up next. So this is, I would say, the, the key effort historically in France to render parapsychology institutional. And as you can see, there are some figures that you may, you, some of you at least may recognize. It started, the instrument of Sussex started in 1919. It was immediately recognized by the, by the state as a foundation of public utility. It's, that doesn't quite translate it, but they, there were some pretty high up people who managed to get that in. And among the uh, people who are known, of course, is Gustave Gelet, uh, Charles Richet, who is a Nobel Prize, Eugenie Osti. I'll be going over some of these just very quickly because it's not the topic today. This is more just a historical. But just to give you a sense, the, the instrument of Sishik has been around for almost a century now, and it's always been a, a kind of a meeting point for a more long-term and persistent or tenacious, tenacious effort to study, understand, psi. In the spirit of the Society for Psycho Research, or the ASPR, in the good old days when the ASPR existed, or like some of the long-term laboratories also, because the orientation of the Institute was more explicitly research than just educational. It's taken on a more of an educational role in recent years, but the, the true orientation from the outset was to conduct research, and especially with gifted subjects in the, year, in the first few decades, which I'd like to go over now. So there are a number of people here. The last person who passed away, unfortunately, was Hubert Larcher, who kind of put a lot of loving, tender loving care into the Institute for over a couple of decades and kept it alive, even in the, the last few decades, at least before I came in, where it was kind of running low on energy and resources but it's, so Larcher is a, a big figure in, in that sense in keeping it alive and he organized conferences. He had other interests and his writings are pretty intricate and kind of not esoteric, but very not always easy to follow for people that are more empirical and, and Anglo-Saxon parapsychologists. So let's go to the next few slides just to give you a kind of a sense of those early years. Uh, Nancy, can you give me a sense? Oh, yeah, okay, before that. That was then, and that's now. Uh, so there are a number, this is uh, our kind of, we, we almost have, it's our only group photo in the nearly 20 years that I've been president of the, 
in 18 years I've been president of the Institute of Chic, and it's quite recent one. There have been a few changes. Uh, Renault is no longer uh, with us, but he's definitely very active in the field, as we'll be seeing. And another person, the third person uh, from the, uh, the second person right of Renault, Jean Beaujoin also. But other than that, this is a pretty complete vision of the instrument of Psychique. One more person joined us recently, and I'll, I'll be going through some, just highlighting a few of the people here. I don't have the time to go through everybody, but we will be seeing some of them. Uh, so, but anyway, I just wanted to contrast then and now to show you that then it was in black and white, now it's in Kodachrome. Next slide, please. So to go up just a bit through the past, the three key moments in Institut Metapsychique work before my era, so to speak. Uh, the one was with Gustave Gelet and his research with uh, Kluski, Franek Kluski, a Polish medium. Uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest mediums of all time. He is famous for the research that was done at the Institut Metapsychique with the hand molds. This was ectoplasm that apparently Kluski was able to produce ectoplasm. Um, so anyway, this research with Kluski was very interesting. I have never, I was a first totally, I thought it was a, a totally implausible until I read the original reports and have been convinced that this is extremely interesting, high-level macro PK research, which is almost one of its kind. There has been a little, some other, but uh, this stands out for the quality of the research. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, that's the topic for definitely a whole other moment. The next slide is another great moment. It's the, mo the research of Eugene Oste with Rudy Schneider. Rudy Schneider also was uh, the, the, the two Schneider brothers. He was one of the two uh, who worked specifically with the uh, Institut of Psychique and Dr. Osti of the Institute. Very interesting research using state-of-the-art efforts. It was a, 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 a infrarouge, oh, infrarouge, uh, infrared, infrared uh, beam that was meant to protect the target objects that that Schneider was supposed to influence from a short distance. It was supposed to protect these objects from any cheating. And in fact, it turned out to be in itself a whole methodology for studying PK uh, because this screen, this infrared screen would repeatedly be triggered by what normally one would think was the medium trying to cheat except that there would be automatic flashlights, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, photos that would go off, and instead of catching him uh, red-handed, they would show Schneider totally immobile and absolutely no movement, and so progressively this became in itself a methodology of research using infrared beams to detect the density of whatever it is that kind of transverses this screen and reaches the object. Again, this is only, I can only give you a very general view and perhaps we'll have time to discuss this later if you're interested. Next slide, please. Yes, René Varcolier, uh, the third person that should be, definitely should be honored here, who did a whole series, did a detailed study of telepathy, uh, qualitative kind of telepathy, uh, a lot like mental radio, of the Sinclairs, and he sustained this for years. He was also in in definite connection with the U.S. and with uh, I, I, uh, with uh, Eileen Garrett, I believe, that they had sessions together at a distance from Paris to New York. And what was interesting about it, he was also, like many at the time, was going on this hypothesis of mental radio and trying to get to find ways to get a let's say, cleaner signal that wouldn't be distorted by uh, different aspects of different cognitive facets of the receiver, which, of course, was, again, in this objectivist, this is always the struggle we have in France between the objectivist and subjective vision, because for other researchers, the part that was the most interesting were the distortions, because they reveal the way the uh, 
let's say, psi signal, but I'm putting that in quotes, is changed, transformed, sublimated, whatever, by the psyche as it's being processed and, and coming out. So, at any rate, Vacolier was, a, again, a tenacious uh, uh, researcher, well-known internationally. Some have told me that he inspired some of the remote viewing, early remote viewing protocols in the approach that he took, so certainly had some influence internationally. Okay, so that's it for the prehistory. That just means before I arrived. No, it's not true. There's still more prehistory, but it's modern research now that I'd like to get into. In the next slide, we'll be talking about now the Institute de Psychique, which is, let's say, starting in the 70s, which is the time zone that I wanted to cover. So one of the works of the mid-70s, again, we have this, this theme that comes about, PK, and again, the, the Geller phenomenon. This time, though, as we all know, there are the mini Gellers, and the Institute had its, uh, its share of mini Gellers. In particular, one of them was quite exceptional, an adolescent named Frédéric, who was tested by Jean-Paul Bailly, who is still with us in, our, in the EMI, and Yvonne de Plessis, who also is still alive. She's over 100 years old. She was honored by the mayor of Paris a couple of years ago. Uh, for Apparently there's some kind of a, a relationship there. They're, they're relatives. At any rate, Jean-Paul and Yvonne and some others at the Institute tested this, these uh, mini Gellers, and they reported some very, very clear-cut uh, metal bending effects under quite satisfactory conditions. You can see the forks here. These are not easy to bend forks. We have them at the Institute. I've looked at them. They are very solid forks. And as you can see, the, the some of them are, I mean, the bends are not just simple bends. These are the kind of things that we come to expect when we talk about any anything that we should consider with metal bending. They also did and specially prepared metal bars that are that were several layers of metal, different kinds of metal, because Jean-Paul Bailly, who is our engineer and inventor, is uh, wanted to test different metals to see if there's a differential kind of effect, uh, so they were glued together. And in, in addition to that, they also found, with these same mini gellers, especially Frédéric, they have a, we have a collection of some Polaroid photos, photography in the in the tradition of um, Ted Sirius, but at any rate, here in the conditions that were tested, as I understand them, they there was no room for cheating. These were very short, quick uh, shots done with these Polaroid apparatuses, no gizmos, no nothing of that sort, and there were a good number of them that had sketchy reproductions of targets that were just handed last minute, uh, shown to the uh, subject, and then the image was, a sketchy kind of image was reproduced that is uh, close to the original, close enough to be recognized. So this was uh, before my time, but as I said, two of the main pro proponents here are still with us, and we have the full collection of objects still at the Institute. Next slide, please. So Jean-Paul, uh, like I said, he's like, uh, he's Mr. Gizmo. He's, uh, he, these are some early random number generators. Uh, you could, if you compare it, those of you who know what random number generators look like today can, uh, will be smiling, no doubt. We can move to the next slide. But Jean-Paul is still active creating all kinds of devices and measuring uh, systems. Okay, this is one. I didn't upload all the images to go with it, but underneath this, this kind of uh, spooky, mediumistic um, fabric, there's quite a bit of hardware and, uh, and electronics. And this is basically an electronic wheel, like a roulette wheel, that is... There, there's a random number generator that connected with a computer that will basic. Okay, let me start all over again. You take the cover off 
which I can't point to you because I don't have it. But the cover is this white, uh, this white thing on the top with 12 uh, positions. And you take it off and the subject, the participant, can place an object inside this circular box, so to speak, it's just underneath, in one of those 12 parts. And then the, the system, then you put the lid back on and the system randomizes the position. So it's turning many times right and left and counterclockwise and white clockwise and, and it's done in such a way that we ensure that all possible sensory knowledge as to where that object is now is lost. And the idea now is that the subject should try, of course, this is like a dowsing experiment, should try and find their object hidden in one of these 12 places. And the interesting thing about this experiment is not so much that it's another dowsing experiment, it's that uh, Jean-Paul has a theoretical uh, agenda here in half of the trials that we'll be collecting, the data, all feedback data is destroyed except for the global result at the end of the experiment, which the experimenter sees. But there's no trial-to-trial -trial feedback. And as opposed to the other half of the trials where the person does get feedback in the form of the lights, the corresponding lights lighting up, informing the person where the object ended up. So in half the trials, we're testing for a clairvoyance ability. And in the other half, by destroying possibility of any immediate precognition feedback, we're testing to see whether it can be claimed that clairvoyance is operational nevertheless, even without precognitive feedback, so to speak or whether we have to conclude that all success is due to a kind of a self-precognition. Uh, you're recognizing your own future and seeing where the object will be when you get the feedback, and that's your source. If that's the case, then only the trials with feedback should give results, whereas if it's not the case, then the clairvoyance and uh, precognition trial should be about equally successful. Okay, another uh, uh, research direction. This is with the help of the Bial Foundation in Portugal, which everybody knows, of course. Uh, so this was a uh, experiment we did two years ago called the Sharefield, the telepathy experiment, uh, which I presented already at the PA. And um, uh, I don't think I'm going to spend too much time in it, but basically the idea is putting both sender and receiver in identical immersive environments and and having sender and receiver alternate roles as sender or receiver throughout over the course of a, a good number of trials, about 20 trials. The results are in the PA proceedings so far. I haven't gotten around to uh, a full paper. I'm hoping uh, we'll, we just published the, well, at any rate, I'm hoping I'll get around to it, Carlos, to answer your question. Uh, at any rate, this produced pretty interesting results, not as exciting as we hoped, because we worked a lot on creating a very fluid, flow-like environment with uh, a star field coming towards the person in this immersive kind of space. And in that star field, every once in a while, there's the target image that appears to the sender, and the receiver has to decide which of two possibilities was the case. Then the roles change, and the, receiver, the X receiver now is the sender and vice versa. And so everything was done to create what we we're hoping to find is the next Gonsfeld, so to speak. So far, we're not there yet, but we know the reasons, one of them being that the immersive environment gets to be very uncomfortable for about 60% of the people that we tested. So that wasn't a very good scheme for, you know, getting a fluid flow-like experience. But we found that out only once the experiment started, so we couldn't stop. So the next step is we're, pre we're preparing a simpler version, one that's strictly precognition, a one-person experiment, 
and we're going to be looking into alternative immersive systems. Okay, so that's the what's coming up in this year's uh, Bial supported research session. So I just want to present a few more individuals that are uh, active in the field in our in in the lab at the uh, EMI. Next slide. So just to present a few more people and, and the research that's being done, Peter Bansell is part of the EMI as well. He's done quite a bit of lot work in conventional physics and published. He's known in the field for his work on the Global Consciousness Project. He's been one of the key analysts of the Global Consciousness Project. And he's presented that work in different papers, some with Roger, some independently. He's also worked a lot on the share field and the cell field, a lot of the, all the programming and the design of the experiment with me and with others. And he's currently involved also in uh, meta analytic work on a, a number of different research paradigms, including the presentiment and um, the micro PK and so forth. We also published some research together uh, on the on the micro PK literature. Uh, recently, that's coming out soon in the Journal of Parapsychology. That's one of the things that we've been doing together. Peter is a major asset for the EMI in terms of research. It's um, it's really good to have him there. It's also great to be able to speak English once in a while. <laughs> Next slide. So besides the research activities, there's quite a bit of educational and clinical activities at the EMI, clinical in the large sense. Now, when I say at the EMI, I'm actually I'm talking about either at the EMI or EMI members, board members that have their own activities as well outside the EMI. But again, what I, the Institute is kind of unique in France in that it's bringing together a lot of individuals who they're all on a voluntary basis, of course, but we all come together and we're kind of accompanying this century old institute and keeping it alive. And many of us have our own activities outside, some of these being related to parapsychology. So Paul Louis Raberon, a psychiatrist, is one of these individuals who uh, has had a course at the Université Catholique de Lyon, an accredited course since 1995, so this is a big achievement. It's been around for 200 years, 500 students, and he's had many of anybody, everybody, anybody who's anyone in France has given, you know, has presented at his course. So this is a, a big thing that's been going on and that, you know, with still 500 people in France are much more educated and much more sophisticated in terms of parapsychology because his course is is pretty interesting. It covers a lot of ground, uh, sociological, experimental, epistemological. It's a it's a high level course. Another activity of Pauli, and this was the founding of the GEMI Groupe d'étudiants de l'IMI. Uh, so in France, there is no real context, or rather, there hasn't been any real context for students, for university students, to find out about to really study parapsychology. That was in the past, things are changing, and I'll get to that. But we decided at some point, and this was Paul Louis and Thomas's initiative, to create a, a context, like let's say like a, an association for students within the institute, and had quite a good number of them come over the course of the years. A lot of very bright uh, uh, doctoral students or masters and doctoral students came through and came out, uh, some of them are still around in the uh, GEMI and many of them have kind of graduated and gone on. Uh, the next slide will show an example of two of these students, but there are many others who have gone on and are doing very interesting things. Uh, the two uh, that I'd like to focus on is, so it's Thomas Raberon, who, as I said, established, was one of the creators of the GEMI, and Renaud Avrar, who's listening to me at this very moment, I think, and who both in the clinical psychology domain, but both uh, also well beyond clinical psychology in terms of their sophistication, their understanding of experimental psychology, parapsychology, 
of theoretical parapsychology. They're two of the most, two of the few individuals in France that understand Walter von Lukadu's pragmatic information theory, who at least claim to understand it, but I believe them. They're pretty good. They've been honored with a few uh, awards. The Schmeidler Outstanding Student Award. Renaud had the PF Award, the Eileen Garrett Scholarship. They're both now uh, lecturers in um, two different universities. Thomas has gone on pretty far. He did, he was a, a doctoral student at the Kessler Chair with Caroline Watt and did some retropriming studies in kind of in the style of Daryl Ben's research. And he went on to do some very good, a very good meta-analysis with BEM and several others on the presentiment, uh, on the uh, BEM type and presentiment type work. So he, and currently he has uh, students interested in parapsychology and I believe Renault, he'll, he'll correct me on this, is going to have students that are interested in parapsychology and accompany them. So we're, um, we're hoping that this will, you know, this kind of model of people coming out of the EMI and going on their own will continue and bloom. And, you know, because Renault and, and Thomas are exceptional, but there are other bright people who come through and uh, who may also end up in universities. And that's an extremely good thing. They also founded a, a center for counseling on exceptional experiences, which helps also people who have issues, problems, experiences that could be problematic whether real or not in an objectivist sense is not the issue. Uh, would be a good accompaniment counseling uh, for these people that uh, need uh, some accompaniment. I can go for the next slide. And I think we're coming to the end. Just more in the educational area. This started even while we, Renault was still with us at the Institute. And Pascal Catala, who's also a member, you saw her photo there, are creating work. We've been creating an online course that's uh, similar to the Kessler chairs, the Kessler online course, good quality. About 100 are going through it since 2014. It's getting good ratings. So this is also part of the Institute's educational work. Next slide, please. So, Joar Siamed, a psychoanalyst, she's been active in the field for a long time as well. She was one of the first people to join, persons to join me when I took on the, uh, the uh, Institute's uh, presidency. She continued the tradition of Warcollier and Marcotte, which was with looking into qualitative telepathy research and she pushed it further in the sense that she created real, long-term, systematic groups that would meet and try to train at entraînement, train in telepathy and improve their scoring, let's say, but by using more than just verbal, uh, let's say, modes of communication and using especially the body, the enactment of the target and she reports very interesting results. Uh, certainly on the qualitative level, it's very difficult to evaluate quantitatively because that's not the objective here. Like with others, like with the GERP and François Favre and a number of others in France, there is this strong tradition, as I said, for looking at Psy in terms in its historical, personal, psychological, meaningful context as opposed to an objectivist quantitative orientation and trying to understand the dynamics that underlie that. So Joao is completely in that direction and she's actively involved in basically most of the research projects that we have at the EMI, including the share field, the self field and others. Next slide, please. Bertrand Meust, a sociologist, epistemologist, as a course in philosophy. He's a very interesting, again, once again, in this tradition of the sociological and historical context of the field. And so he's been doing a lot of 
qualitative in-depth studies of interesting uh, psychics over the past, his, including, for example, the, he's looked, taken a very close look to the Titanic, and contrary to some of the received opinions, he finds that there is a, a lot of good evidence for a major, um, a numerous premonitions related to the Titanic. Uh, he had a, a major thesis on the history of the, the emergence of the psychical sciences out of uh, mesmerism. And uh, his latest book is on Jesus Christ, the historical figure, and specifically on the miracles of Jesus Christ, not looking necessarily to prove that the miracles were true, but setting these in the parapsychological context and asking the rhetorical questions, can we consider the possibility that this is not just metaphorical, but there was uh, a kind of a historical events that involved miracles. So it's a, he's a very interesting, he does a lot of conferences, he's quite well known in France for his work, and he's been invited to the States, uh, for example, at the Esalen conferences, the in, internal workshops, because he's quite knowledgeable in all these historical aspects and philosophical aspects. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, sorry, this is kind of, I should have edited this first, but is to say also that there have been others that I haven't been able to get too much in detail of, like La Platine and uh, Christine Berger. I mentioned Christine Hardy and Bertrand did. And it's also to mention the other activity still in the this educational approach. We've been putting out for several years now a bulletin metapsychique, it replaced the the much more, uh, let's say, academic uh, Revue Metapsychique, which the Institute was putting out starting in 1920 and all the way up to 1980 for 60 years. But in 2007, I believe, we started putting out the Bulletin Metapsychique, and it's a more accessible general public review, but we still are, are pretty demanding in terms of the quality of the articles and the and the you know the level of it, we're, we're not looking to make just a, any old general public uh, magazine. This is the last issue, which is dealing with presentiment, focusing on precognition and presentiment. And I think that's it. If the, I think the next slide should say goodbye, or if it doesn't, well, it will say goodbye. This is just a, a reminder that there have been other people that have been associated with the institute and we created an association called the Friends of the EMI, and that was a shot of the Friends of the EMI with whom we have a very close collaboration. Voila! <laughs> I think that's it. So I'm uh, happy to use whatever time people feel like giving to this to, to answer questions. Um, thank you, thank you very much, um, um, Mario. And uh, this has been wonderful and technologically interesting. <laughs> um, and to let the students know that the PowerPoint as a whole will be in the course schedule after the after this last session, as well as uh, that biography uh, slide that I was unable to get up there. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions, please put them in the yeah. um, put them in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's one question about uh, Frederick Kluski. It, it's not really my subject for tonight, but I um, I deserve getting a question on it because I brought it in. <laughs> but the the thing is that, and, and I think this is very relevant to the, as I said, the social historical kind of perspectives on Psy. I think that was a unique era, and there were lots of mediums, physical mediums, popping up here and there. Many of them probably fraudulent, some of them sometimes fraudulent, but sometimes real, and some of them really genuine and uh, probably rare. And I think that today, if we are to look for this kind of huge types of phenomena, then we would need to look in cultures that still maintain a very living tradition uh, in terms of spiritism or mediumship and physical phenomena, I think the best chances are in Brazil right now for that. There are some groups that are still playing around in, in France also, 
with uh, some form of transcommunication, you know, instrumental transcommunication, including using somewhat sophisticated devices like vapor devices to try and see if they can capture faces. I'm not too close to those uh, groups. We are planning to visit them and see what they're up to. But I believe that other than Kluski and Palladino, maybe there were one or two others that, that had some of that kind of you know, 3D, well-controlled 3D masks or, and, and moulage hand molds coming up. But I'm not aware of any much more that happened after that. It, uh, I must say also that it was kind of tragic. Those ended in tragedy because Gustave Gelet, who uh, had initiated this research at, at the IMI, was, had flown to Poland for some new renewed sessions with Kluski. And he was, they went, they had some very successful sessions, and he was on his way back with a bag full of new hand molds, apparently, and the plane crashed and uh, all aboard died. That's how that, that uh, research ended. Oh, dear. Yeah. Joao's research. Was she inspired by Vakulé? Well, she's in the tradition of Vakulé because there is the, like I said, it's the qualitative research. It's getting much more uh, involved with automatisms, you know, like letting letting the hand guide you or letting your body guide you. So there, there, there's a lot of that, of letting the unconscious express itself without too much trying to condition it into specific words or whatever. In that sense, she is in the tradition of Vakulier. She's in the tradition also of Marcotte, who I didn't know, but who was starting with these group telepathy kind of ideas to see if groups can reinforce, can render the, the uh, reception better. This was, be I believe, before there was the idea of majority vote that came through in, in the uh, remote viewing, the uh, associative the, the remote viewing kind of protocols. So Joy is in that tradition, but she pushed it further in the sense that she specifically acknowledges and works with the unconscious and with automatisms, as opposed to trying to kind of purify the signal and get it into some kind of objectivist uh, quantitative analysis. Yeah, I agree with Carlos that definitely was worth following up. Oh, and I, I posted on my PowerPoint, I posted a link to some of my CD-ROMs example of War Collier, the kinds of uh, correspondences that were found in during War Collier's experiments. But those of you who have the CD-ROM, of course, don't need that. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Yes. Uh, Brian, Brian is top. Any more questions? I think Brian is writing. Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on. I should be trying to figure this out without seeing it. Oh, great. <laughs> the one thing I forgot to mention. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> now there's a topic. Uh, the, the very first research project, I major research project I conducted at the IMI, and that was with the help of the Bial Foundation, was the CINEG project. And the idea was, it was inspired by the Global Consciousness Project. So everybody I assume knows about the GCP, I don't need to get into it. Uh, but the idea was to do a kind of a, a local global consciousness egg to see if within a, a restricted area, we can more, we can zero in more closely on what's going on. Because the Global Conscious Project is very powerful, but it's very global also. And it's hard to attribute uh, a causal kind of direct, you know, uh, cause effect analysis, uh, which is of course one of the critiques, the major critiques of, of Peter is that it, it doesn't, he believes that it's not what it seems to be, and he's written a number of articles on this, and that's, so at any rate, at this time, this was back a long time ago, the hope was to take the ongoing, the continually sampled RNG placed in a movie theater, 
and sampled regularly. And it would be sampled in association with peak moments in the film. So that implied going ahead of time into the film, and I and another person, we would judge which are the peak moments, when do they start, when do they end. So, you know, like a chase scene or when, you know, the, 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 the bad guy or the good guy or whatever gets a, a knife in his stomach or whatever. So we chose a number of films and we, we, we created a kind of a, a framework pre, in advance and we predicted that there would be enhanced uh, variants specifically in the moments that correspond to those uh, peaks in the film. So that demanded a very close timing and it was very complicated to get movie theaters to cooperate with this. We finally got two of them, but it, it, it was a very complicated field experiment. We, we lost two of the major trials out of five. <laughs> so that makes for a big loss of data. And overall, I'd say that the, the, the end results were, were not, definitely not significant. And I'd say basically the hypothesis wasn't tested because it, it, we had so little data in the end compared to the kind of data that you see in the Global Consciousness Project. It was a, an unlikely kind of thing with, with the loss of data and so forth. And it was so complicated to set up and uh, that, that we just didn't have the stomach to try it again. So that's the, the uh, 122nd version of the CNEC project. Well, thank you for, for bringing that up. I think Brian is writing a comment. And Wim uh, Cromer just left a minute ago and said thank you very much for the, the presentation. Yeah. I'm, I'm not turning on my video because I actually have two computers. There's actually three computers in this room running your, running your talk. <laughs> it's what's going on at the moment. So are there any other questions, guys? Yeah, Brian is saying sounds really yeah. interesting. Well, if there's, no, if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank you very much, Mario, for doing such a great job over the last couple of days putting together a really wonderful presentation. I, it really gave us a lot of information we probably didn't know about the research in France and where Imi is taking it. And um, I think it's just it's yet another piece of very optimistic news for everybody in the field. So thank you very much. And I'm going to close the, the course down in just a sec. The PowerPoint will be up in the classroom this evening. The biographical slides will be up in the classroom this evening. And the recording should be ready, if not this evening, then tomorrow. And you'll be able to come back and see if you missed anything, if you came in late or were in and out because of other kinds of technological problems. So. Okay. Thank you again, Mario. Well, thank you. Yay. Thank you all for uh, for holding out <laughs> with the technical problems. <laughs> and uh, I must say that not a problem. I must say that the fact that I, having done this, I mean, I was cursing midday, but having done this, I, it was a very good exercise for me because <laughs> um, generally the French are kind of pessimistic, and uh, France has rubbed off on me, and I'm kind of pessimistic. But tonight, I'm more optimistic about French parapsychology than I was yesterday. So <laughs> finally, it's pretty good. Oh, uh, we're well, doing pretty good. That's wonderful. I mean, we're all, after the last few presentations, we're all very happy. So I suggest getting into the conference and watching some of the other ones. Um, there's a lot of work going on that's not visible on the international stage. So. <laughs> So thank you very much, guys, and we will see you at the top of the hour for the final closing session of the of the International Affiliates Conference. Lizette has some closing words, and we want to give you the heads up about some of the things that the PF will be doing this year coming, which is our 65th anniversary. So thank you very much, and I'm closing the course, and thank you so much, Mario. It was wonderful. Thanks, thanks guys. Bye.